uh, annual Students in Mind conference. My name is Julia Caddy, and um, those of us here with the underscore before our name are members of the organizing committee for this conference. Since Students in Mind is based at McGill, we would like to begin by acknowledging that McGill University is located on the traditional territory of the Ganakatagi nations, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. Students in Mind honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we are hosting our events. Just because some of us have not faced certain issues does not mean they are not happening. We must bring up these circumstances for greater awareness and actively oppose systems of oppression. It isn't enough just to acknowledge these struggles. We must ensure that we are educated about such matters and put meaning to them in hopes of stepping towards an equitable and mutually respective relationship. It's important to understand the longstanding history that has brought each of us to reside on the land and to seek to understand those places within history. Land acknowledgements don't exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is an ongoing process and we need to be, build our mindfulness um, in the present. Therefore, everyone is encouraged to acknowledge and learn more about the colonial history of the land they are on. Now a quick sustainability notice. Um, we're proud to announce that our event has been certified um, through the virtual event certification from the McGill Office of Sustainability. Um, in order to achieve this, we implemented actions like working with socially responsible sponsors and making sure our event follows accessibility guidelines. Now, this year, our conference theme is Forging a New Normal. It's no secret that students are struggling and the time for forging healthier campuses is right now. 2020 has showed us a lot of negatives, um, but it also showed us opportunities and change. Many have said that the normal we emerge to after this needs to look different than the normal we had before. If you're here, it means you believe in students, um, that students matter and that mental health matters. Our conference will consist of speakers, workshops, presentations, et cetera, covering various topics about comfortably and successfully forging a new normal. As illustrated on our schedule, every day we have two workshop sessions happening at the same time. As participants, you can choose which ones you'd like to attend and just click the Zoom links that are provided um, in the, the time and title of the schedule. This evening, we're focusing specifically on identifying the gaps, the barriers, the problems that have arisen in our daily lives, especially due to the pandemic. Tomorrow, we'll look into what's working, successes and positives, and on the third day, we're gonna talk about the tools and practices that'll allow us to move forward amidst the pandemic and a changing world. Now it's important we touch on some quick safety information. Um, mental health, although it is something we all possess and share, is also incredibly personal and we all have unique needs. With this in mind, we want to highlight the following. Some of the content discussed may be triggering or disturbing to some people. So if you have any concerns, would like to provide us with feedback or require assistance, please message any of the exec members in the chat. Again, that's the one with the underscore in front of our names. And we also have our preferred pronouns displayed. Um, we'd also welcome any of you to display your preferred pronouns as well. We'd also like to invite you to turn off your mics and cameras um, in order to conserve energy and also noting um, that we will be recording sessions. So if you'd like to stay private, that's how you can do so. Now, keeping in mind that this event welcomes and encourages healthy debate on different issues surrounding mental health, we wanna remind everyone that this is a safe space. Um, this means we aim to ensure that Everyone here is respected regardless of their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or religious beliefs. If you or at any point feel unsafe, please report any incidents um, to one of the exec members. All this being said, we've also created what we call the chill zone. Um, that link is included in the conference schedule. You can join this at any point. Um, it'll be a quiet place to feel comfortable. It could be used as a break room. And there'll also be an active listener available if anyone needs to, to, to talk to someone. Additionally, um, this, uh, there'll be some activities in this chill zone if, if you want an active way to relax. Additionally, we do have a lobby room, again, in the conference schedule. 
If you're having logistical issues, that is your place to go. Um, we will be there to help you throughout the conference. Now, this schedule that I'm referring to, you should all have received in an email. Um, so feel free to refer to it throughout the weekend. Click the links in order to get the sessions. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to one of the exec members. Um, now, social media. So we are active on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So feel free to not only follow us, but share what we post um, and post, for, post your own experiences and tag us and we'll share. Um, it's also important to note that during the conference, we're posting um, mental health resources and live updates through Twitter. Um, that's at, at students in mind too, um, shown there and also in the conference uh, package that was sent to you. So um, metaphorical drum roll and we're going to move on to our first keynote speaker. So it's with my honor and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mohammed Al Salih, to present their keynote address. He is an international speaker and award-winning advocate. After losing cousins to cancer, Mohammed decided to become a physician with a specialization in oncology. But during a final exam in medical school, he was arrested by Syrian state security and was brutally tortured for 120 days. After averting death in prison, he was forced to flee his home and made an extraordinary journey to Vancouver, BC, arriving in Canada as a refugee in late 2014. Today, he is an inspirational speaker that brings the voice of refugees to the international stage. He has been recognized by the likes of Justin Trudeau and Hollywood's George Takei. And in 2018, he received the RBC Top 25 Canadian Immigrant Award for his advocacy efforts. From Syria to Canada, his journey was famously featured in the documentary, Welcome to Canada. Please everyone join me in welcoming Mohammed. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, could you please confirm that you hear me well? Amazing, thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who's joining us today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with everybody. So if you can confirm that as well. <clears throat> so I don't really see you if you can uh, let me know we can that see you hear me and we can and see my you. screen. Yes. Perfect. Awesome. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and um, I'd like to take this opportunity to commend uh, students in mind, uh, exec, uh, everybody who participated in making this uh, true uh a live event that we are engaging in right now thank you so much um again i'm gonna start by trying to make it a visual as much as possible of a presentation and if you're wondering what is this this is planet earth right now we are somewhere here in north america close to South America, where there is a vast ocean between us and the rest of the world, being Europe, Africa, and Asia. I come from here, the other side of the world, pretty much. So if we zoom in to this part of the world known as the Middle East, So here is a country called Syria. Very, very, very small. We start by trying to talk about this part of the world more. So Syria is surrounded by different countries, being Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, 
a tiny country here called Lebanon. And here we have Israel plus Palestine. Zooming in more. to Syria, where I come from. I was born right here in a city called Al Hasake. This country and this city is where I was born. And I'd like to start by talking about my journey uh, from where it starts, from this city. So this city is a diverse city, a place where uh, a lot of cultures are co-existing and co-living together. For example, in the street, you will hear Arabic spoken and you will hear Kurdish. Um, walking in there, you will see uh, mosques and churches uh, side by side. And um, I really like to describe it as a Canada that is in the Middle East very, very, very diverse. So a bit of a background of Syria and its history, because it's really important to understand what's happening right now and there. See, 1971 is when we had a coup, a coup that installed the Assad dictatorship in Syria. They are ruling from 1971 until right now, 2021. See, in Syria, the president hasn't changed since the 71, seriously. And this has impacted the country and shaped it in a very, very, uh, uh, shaped it and attached it in its very core because uh, we are talking about a dictatorship that uh, turned uh, a really diverse place into a um, um, police state where only one opinion matters and cancel every other voice. Um, thinking more about the history and the connection between history and the moment right now, we have to think about the year 2011. See, in between 71 until today, the year 2011 is the year that changed everything because that's the year of revolution. So maybe let's talk more about revolution, 2011 of revolution. It started as part of the Arab Spring. Arab Spring is the bigger umbrella. Arab Spring started as a wave of democracy that started in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and Syria. Also not to forget about Libya, and I think <laughs> Libya, I think I'm not spelling Libya right, but that's okay because we are talking about Syria. So the year 2011 brought dreams of democracy. And speaking about dreams, back then in 2011, I was on my dream of becoming a doctor. Back to the Syrian map where I was born in Hasake, I moved to a central city called Homs to go for school. And in 2011, I was a fourth year medical student. And already by then I had fulfilled my newest dream, which is to own an iPhone. It wasn't an iPhone, it was a regular phone, but a phone with a camera. I can never forget the day that my life changed in March 
where I became, or I went from a medical student to a terrorist. I was in the central square in Homs, Syria. There were crowds that are chanting and demonstrating against the atrocities of the Assad regime. So I grab my phone and start filming the uprising. But suddenly two policemen tackle me to the ground. Terrorists, terrorists, they shout at me. They start hitting me with their batons on my head. With every blow, I could feel a uh, shock going through my entire body and uh, my blood started dripping and I could see my white shirt turning red. Mm. So I'm trying to tell the policeman, I'm not a terrorist. I'm a medical student, but they are beating me again and they are trying to take my phone. I try to resist. So one policeman grabs my phone from my hand and I resist. So he pulls out his gun and puts it to my head. And that's when I realized that in the battle between a gun and a, a, a man, a gun is a winner. So I let go of my phone and um, I surrender. From there, from that day, I was labeled a terrorist by the Syrian government. From that day into the next two years, in the span of two years, I was in and out of prison for three times. In total, I was held in seven different prisons and detention centers. And I'm not here today to talk about what happens in prisons and torture and all of that because it's been covered. The most horrible things happen there. And it's the worst part of humanity. But I'm here today to talk about the other side of humanity. And by that, I mean, see how, sorry if you hear this, but my dog is parking in the background. Um, and I hope it's not disturbing you, but um, I'm sharing those details so you can see why by looking at these graphs that I'm sharing, why would someone make the decision to leave their country, leave their home and go to a new place, start over. As a result of all this, I fled Syria to Lebanon. So Lebanon is this part here, it's a really small country that is encircled by Syria. So as a, as a refugee, my life was either to be safe in here, but with nothing, no life, no education, no opportunities, or try to continue your life, your school, your family, but maybe you will go to prison again. It's not safe. So the dilemma here is the lack of um, control over your life. And that's how I want to summarize it to you. If you are wondering what is what does it mean to be a refugee, it means that you are in total lack of control of your life. Nothing of your life is your own. You can't make your own decisions. 
you can't, it's not my choice. It wasn't my choice to stay in Syria and go to school because I was pushed away by danger. And I didn't choose my destination. I went to Lebanon where I wasn't really um, welcome. I didn't, uh, uh, I was offered the worst jobs and I couldn't go back to school. And um, my choices were limited to these two. Until Canada stepped in. So let me talk about how Canada refugee resettlement work. See, Canada works with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, they work together to help refugees and to invite them to come to Canada. And lucky me, I was chosen by the United Nations for resettlement to Canada. So imagine there is a refugee. Actually, they're like this after they leave their country. And ask, what are your choices? What can you do? Well, first of all, you can leave the country where you live in to another country and try to local, do local integration. Means leave Syria, go to a new place for me that was Lebanon, for other Syrians that's Turkey or Egypt or any neighboring country and try to, to locally integrate because what is the second choice that you have as I, as I shared in my um, previous uh, um, slide or not slide, but it, it was um, to go back home. So that is called voluntary repatriation. So basically you either stay outside or try to go home voluntarily. These are your only two choices, unless you were offered resettlement. Resettlement is a solution, is the third solution that is offered by the United Nations, High Commission for Refugees, in partnership with other countries like Canada, like US, uh, Germany, etc. All these countries work with the UNHCR to resettle refugees and offer them a third different um, option. So back to my story, that's what happened to me. I was resettled to Canada and arrived in late 2014 in the part of the first group of Syrian refugees. So back to that time, Canada had welcomed um, in 2014, about 200 government sponsored assisted refugees. 28 of them were going to BC and I was one of the first 28 people that came to British Columbia as Syrian refugees. And that happened under the previous government of uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And then later what happened in 2015, we had elections, government change, and that government wanted to expand this, as you can see, really limited. So the approach, the new approach was kicked off by the promise of bringing on 25,000 Syrian refugees to Canada and uh, and now we're in 2021, the efforts from here to there, 
I think Canada has welcomed over maybe 70,000 uh, refugees from Syria, which is great. But, you know, before we leave Syria and come to Canada, let's imagine this country. By now, you're all familiar with the map that before the war, we had about 20 million uh, population. So after the war, this is pre-war, after the war, we had lost 50% of the population. So we're talking about, about 1 million people killed by the dictatorship. We are talking about 5 million people uh, displaced as the refugees outside of the country. We're talking about 10 million people internally displaced. displaced. So the limited number that came to Canada is nothing compared to the big, more alarming, like, yeah, we're talking about the country that lost 50% of its population since 2011 into 2021. Uh, that's, that's really disastrous. And again, like, just look at what I'm graphing here. And I don't know, I'm just looking at it and thinking, thank God for Canada and thank God for everything that Canada does because it's the only shining example that I have here in my story. So back to Canada, now I'm gonna try to uh, sketch Canada. Uh, we have Vancouver Island here and we have something like this. As you know, we have our 10 provinces and three territories and all that. I came here to Vancouver to start over my life. And I want to share with you what happens. What is, what is it like? So as a newcomer in a new country, the challenges are very um, diverse. So language is the first that comes to mind. There is a language barrier. What does that mean? That means that uh, you are supposed to learn a new language. I found myself here um, and try to communicate the difficulty with you, but um, think about this. I, before coming to Canada in 2014, I never spoke English. I had to learn this language here. And uh, in my first year here, it was very challenging because um, if you don't speak the language, it's, you can't do anything. But it's not the only challenge because in addition to that, you have to start over. That's very difficult. You have to find a new house, for example. Housing in Vancouver, oh my God, so difficult. Um, Loneliness. I was super lonely. I don't have a community, right? And the challenges go on and on and on. There's a lot of challenges. And what I'm trying to communicate here is to try to help you understand how the main challenge is actually that um, there's a lot of things to overcome. Your job is to overcome, but you have to overcome all of these together. You are fighting on so many fronts and you have to survive. So I want you to imagine when I first came here and I am supposed to start over, right? 
So it works like this. I was given $809 to start over. This is like monthly. What does this supposed to cover? I have to pay rent. I have to get my transportation sorted, transportation, and I had to live all on all it's uh, $800. So my rent back in the day was $550. So that left me with less than 300 or like even less to do everything else in life. It was very, 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 very difficult. And even though it looks like that, I would like to bring another slide here, another picture. See here, it is better than the status quo that I was supposed to live in as a refugee, either uh, live in an in a resentful environment or go back to live in war. No, there's a third option that I was happy with, which is a rough start, a very tough and difficult one in Canada, but that's okay because nothing is perfect. Moving on to talk about the uh, being um, a refugee on a mental health level. What does that mean? As a result of the complex background, uh, circumstances, and uh, reality of refugees, many, including me, find themselves in a um, really difficult situation where your job is to fight all the time. Because if you don't fight, the other option is flight, run. This fight or flight situation uh, on an extended uh, period of time results in post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and anxiety. But see, the thing is that you don't really you have no time for these things. Why? Because you have to study, you have to like study, work, start over, whatever. Like you have, this is like, this bubble is your complicated life and you can't really focus on these things. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of newcomers need time to process and this by time I mean like five years at least after five years maybe so coming back to me and sharing details about my story uh, the first five years for me here were all like hard work learning English trying to start over get on work, save and money, etc. And only after spending enough time here that I started to have time for myself. And I was able to see the doctors and try to approach uh, my mental health and treat it and take in meds and um, etc. So right now for me personally, I am healing. I am processing right now, processing. And 
it is a wonderful journey because for the first time in so many years, I have time to think about myself. And finally, remember when we talked about the theme of being a refugee is lack of control? Well, now, finally, I think that myself is starting to have control back. And this is the road to healing, in my opinion. And healing means a lot of things, but above all is community. And that's why I am so proud and happy to talk to you today, to students in mind and your community, because that's what you're doing. You're doing community building to help people heal, to help people have control back over their lives and to process. And this only works when we come together, when we care. So students in mind, in my opinion, care. And that's why we are here to learn together and to help people have a healing experience. I am, uh, I just stopped uh, sharing my screen and, and um, I will uh, use the rest of my time to take questions and to engage with you, uh, to uh, help you fill any gaps. But that's, uh, I tried in my slides and my pictures to provide you with an overview of what it means to be a refugee, what is the process, and what, what does, where is the mental health conversation fits in all of this? So now to you, uh, Julia, and um, if there's any questions that we can, talk about or um, um, it's yeah back to you thank you so so much Mohammed uh, your honesty and openness and sharing your story is is very commendable and the insight into the complexity of the situation I mean it really goes to show that you know mental health isn't just about mental health services you know housing is mental health financial situations are mental health, violence is mental health. Um, and I think your story paints that so well. And, and to hear that you're on, on a healing process, I think is so empowering um, to know that, that it's possible and that others facing similar situations can find, find a place of healing as well. I do encourage anyone who does have um, any questions they wanna ask Mohammed to put them in the chat and I can read them out. Um, or to raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, um, I guess maybe I'll start off by asking a question if that's okay. Um, and this might be a pretty broad question, but um, for those of us who have had the privilege of, of growing up in Canada, what can we do to support refugees specifically I mean, overall, but especially when it comes to their mental health and, and their need for that space and time to heal. Thanks for the question. Yeah, um, uh, recognizing, first of all, recognizing that mental health issues are not, uh, or are different for different people. So the context of mental health in a, world, a first world country uh, is very different from how it is uh, uh, for a war torn country. Uh, the suffering and the struggle is the same. It's about one's self and one's ability to have control over their life, but the uh, leading causes are different. So it becomes really hard to communicate between somebody who lives here and somebody who is a newcomer to hear, okay, how do we approach this? It's really hard. It's like a cultural clash uh, that is, um, that makes you feel powerless. So where do you bring, where do you get this power to uh, 
help people heal is by first giving people time so a lot of the a lot of instances when you see like how it is uh, portrayed on the media uh, you know any refugee narrative would be like um, well this happened there is war they fled here they came to Canada it's the happy ending blah blah like you know they lived happily ever after so this is in my opinion very wrong actually coming to Canada and starting over here is like a challenge of its own it's not the happy ending but it's the start of a new challenge that you know what newcomers and immigrants and refugees take it very happily and they don't complain but they always like anybody that i talk to they always tell you that listen we struggle here we suffer here we didn't choose to come here it's our life is not uh, you know in our control so would you please like recognize that and help us be on a healing path um, so like this kind of recognition it really helps uh, people to be on the same uh, on, the, on the right uh, spot for healing the other thing is uh, you know is continuing on doing the awesome things that we do here in Canada, like this conference, for example, to see that students care, students come together to talk about uh, health, uh, mental health, and what does it mean for different populations? And today we're talking about the newcomer narrative, but I saw that you have a lot of other aspects that are being covered because you guys are, are like preparing yourself for what's coming next. and. Uh, you will be occupying, you guys will be occupying all the like uh, uh, positions and all the uh, structures that are uh, there for us to engage uh, as, as citizens of this land. Um, and by continuing on having this uh, mindset of openness, uh, we can create the right circumstances for, for healing. And healing is a process, finally. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not a, 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 it's not a clear path, a checklist. It's not like that. It is uh, a journey. And let's be on our own journeys for healing and help others uh, have their own journey uh, and be there for them. Thank you so much for your answer. I I think what I really hear you saying is is that focus on healing as a process, not a okay, I'm over here, check the box, I'm done, I'm all good. It's I mean just really the start of this this whole journey, this whole process. Um, and I think you bring up a good point too about, you know, somebody may look like they're they're coping just fine or like, you know, they're going to work, they're here. They feel grateful, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're okay. And it's important to check in and always exactly. give people the benefit of the doubt and, and be supportive in whatever way we can. Um, I see a question in the chat. And then also I see that Harry has raised their hand. I'm gonna start with the question in the chat. Um, Diamond says, thank you, first of all. Um, they're a journalist who is, in the, who is a child of immigrants. Uh, so uh, issues about newcomers, immigrants, and refugees are super close to their heart. Um, and they're wondering, as a journalist specifically, how can they portray newcomers, immigrants, refugees, um, their narratives in a way that will support their mental health and their healing process and help them thrive in Canada? Thank you so much. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, uh, one of, uh, like hearing the question and uh, this um, person who's asking, uh, sharing that they are a child of, uh, of immigrants to this country. And uh, this immediately make me think about uh, the, the unique challenges that this population specifically uh, faces. People who are born here to immigrant families have a burden that, uh, that is really hard to 
deal with because um, there is a certain tax, quote unquote, that comes with immigrating to Canada. And basically what happens is that the immigrants themselves, the parents who come here are the ones who are paying this tax, paying the price of coming here, dealing with racism and, and all sorts of challenges of, of, of coming here, thinking that they, okay, they have to pay that price and then they will be okay here. But then the generation that is born here find themselves also facing this discrimination, facing this uh, cruelty and having to continue to pay the price for something that they didn't do. Their parents, you know, <laughs> made this decision. So, you know, I my heart goes to you, to the person who uh, sent this question and I hope you're not dealing with that, but I'm really, I really feel for you. Um, how can you uh, help uh, contribute to the betterment of the media by uh, centering uh, refugee voices, by centering immigrant voices, by building the narrative around the points that are raised by refugees, because it's most of the times, not just in media, in, in, in settlement sector, for example, uh, most of the initiatives are things that we think good for are good for refugees. It's not the other way around. It's not things that we heard from refugees that, okay, we, they, they, a lot of the time refugees are not decision makers, but they are, uh, they are a topic. And we have experts talking about the topic, but people of concern are never given a proper platform. A lot of the times, a lot of journalists I notice like write their stories and then like just fill in the gaps of some quotes from like people they interview to like support their own point. So don't do that uh, to all media outlet, outlets out there. Uh, I ask you to have a trauma informed practice in your reporting to be aware of people's traumas and by centering their voices. Um, and avoid cancel culture. And that's where I'm gonna end it. Don't cancel the other voices. Even if it was anti-refugee voices, they have to be heard, but in a proper conversation. Once again, thank you so much for your answer there. Um, I mean, within within our context, centering voices of those with the experience is so important. And I, I mean, what you're saying makes so much sense in terms of this needs to be continued in the media and with refugees. Um, so Harry seems to have typed their question in the chat. So I'm gonna share this now. Again, um, thank you. Um, they're a therapist and wondering um, what you wish therapists knew or could do better um, in order to support the mental health and healing of a client who is a refugee? That's an excellent question. And uh, thank you so much for talking about this because as, as a therapist, uh, I think, um, uh, and not just therapists, uh, uh, people in general has to uh, understand a bit about how therapy is approached in here versus how therapy is looked at uh, in uh, for uh, someone who's a newcomer to Canada. For example, in 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 my context, in as someone from a Syrian family, from a Syrian background, um, emotions, for example, you know, in therapy, what you do is talking about your emotions, but. If you are an, a Middle Eastern person, you never talk about your emotions. Like therapy is not is not heard of in in my culture. Like we never talk about our feelings directly. We never address them uh, when we have a tough conversation to have. We tend to be direct, yes, but we miss this piece about emotions. Whereas I noticed here that um, therapy and therapy conversation and talk therapy and all that is based about uh, talking, addressing directly 
your emotions and um, I personally have difficulty doing that because I didn't grow up in a community that allows me to talk about my emotions. My emotions are not important. They don't matter. Like really, uh, in the Middle East, we're brought up to believe that what matters is the community, what the community thinks, what the community, how people view you, how people talk about you, and what you think, your opinion, your emotions, that's garbage. So that is not really relevant. So to come here and to have these switched and suddenly your opinion matters, your emotions matter, and the heck with, with society and what they think, and we have to talk about what you think, this is really hard to understand. It took me years to uh, switch from a mentality of you know, a collective culture versus uh, the mentality of uh, uh, individualistic culture. So back to the question, uh, I think therapists could uh, become better in helping newcomers if they kind of, you know, recognize this difficulty where uh, in a collective community, like for example, you know, I, I'm gonna end on this note. Uh, the question of like, what is my favorite color? Before I coming to Canada, I didn't know what my favorite color is. You know why? Because nobody asked me because nobody cares. Because like even me, I didn't have a chance to think with myself, what's my favorite color? But then when I came to Canada, when I had, like lived here enough, I realized that I can have a favorite color that is my own favorite color that I can answer this question with. But you know, it, it took years of living here to uh, grasp this cultural difference. Uh, I don't know, I hope this answers the question and um, I can talk to, more to it if we have other questions. Thank you once again. I think that illustrates it so nicely of, you know, you really have to meet someone where they're at and things that we take for granted or like just just automatically assume, you know, are, are so different based on the context you've come from. And it's like speaking a whole new language, a whole different language. And I imagine if my therapist was talking in a language I didn't understand, that wouldn't be too helpful. Um, and so thank you for the insight there. And even your example about the favorite color that that's very eye-opening um, to me and I'm sure others others share that. that uh, it is red, if anyone is wondering, red. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, we are coming to the end of the time, our time here. And so I wanna say thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart and from everyone here and everyone on the team. Um, we do have uh, sessions following after this that everyone is encouraged um, to join. We'll send the link in the chat if, if you wanna easily just click on to the next one instead of finding the link. Um, we will also be posting a recording of this um, speech um, and session afterwards. It'll be on YouTube and we'll be sharing it um, through likely our, our Facebook page. So you could check there for when it's posted. Obviously there's the whole video loading thing that tends to take time, but we will get it up there. So those of you that, that may have missed parts can, can check in. But with that, um, I encourage everyone to move on to the next session. And once again, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you so much, everyone. My pleasure. Bye bye.